All right. We're moving on to Wednesday, April 5th. And during this lecture, we're going to finish talking about succession. As you may remember, in a lot of communities, there's this predictable progression of species, different types of species that fill different roles over time. And the typical scenario is that there is some kind of a disturbance and there is a reestablishment of some initial type of organisms there, typically weeds, things that are good at surviving in conditions that aren't very stable, conditions where it's advantageous to be able to take advantage of an opportunity very quickly species that aren't such good competitors. So the first thing we looked at was primary succession, which happens from time to time when there's brand new habitat. Nothing else is there. There's no living things that are found there. Now we're talking about secondary succession. So this is quite common and it falls within this idea that we looked at in quite a bit of detail, this disturbance. We looked at, at uh, disturbance in terms of uh, equilibrium models and non-equilibrium models and how those shape the type of community that you find and how communities respond to those. So if you look in this figure, we're talking about a different situation where it doesn't go back to a situation where there's no living things or it doesn't start out with that situation but it goes back to uh, the the community basically is disturbed sometimes community is destroyed what kind of things do that well the fires landslides if you look at this list here humans are responsible for a lot of things that cause communities to be disturbed so there's some soil, there's some sediments, there's some microorganisms, some living things there. And then this the community members basically show up again. They're there for a while, then they're altered over time, they change, and eventually you get to this climax community. So that's what we're looking at here in terms of secondary succession. It's not a bare rock, it's not a brand new island, but it's some habitat that's been disturbed by some of those causes that we looked at earlier in that last slide. So here's some examples of secondary succession following a fire. A big fire, all the, the trees, that there was, could be some tall trees, 100 feet tall, that are burned down and now you've got this new habitat. There's still living things there. Everything wasn't destroyed in fire. There's still a lot of soil. So you start out with these pioneer species. And you see in this top scenario, that might take a couple of years. And then there's some species that come along later when conditions are a little better. And you have some grasses and small flowers. And then you get to intermediate species that are... It's kind of a combination of species that are good at establishing themselves in these initial conditions, but they're also fairly good competitors, and they can last for quite a while. They can take advantage of stable communities, stable conditions. And then eventually, you've got this climax community. So this community, there aren't going to be changes after this from a biological perspective, unless there's some kind of disturbance that's biologically related, but this climax community could last for hundreds or thousands of years. Around here, I'm sure you've all seen these forests, there's a huge amount of, of woods in Rhode Island, a lot of the states where you guys are from, and quarantined. In terms of oak, there's a lot of oak, and there's a lot of maple in our climax communities. So you see the timeline there on the bottom. This could take 150 years. That's if a fire, like in the middle down there, in the, the pictures on the bottom, maybe the, there's a woodland that was chopped down. That's what the forests in New England are like. There's a huge number of these forests that were 
chopped down. You know, you, Westerners from Europe have been here for 400 years, and we've been chopping trees down, trying to farm, and we realized it wasn't such a good place to farm. It's from this turn that they made, deciding which way the Mayflower was going to go to the north instead of to the south, came into this New England area that ended up not being very good for farming. So a lot of these forests that you see, the oak and the maple, they're 100 years old or so, and they're that old because that was about how long ago that people stopped farming. So you're walking around the woods. I'm sure some of you guys have experienced this. And you're in the middle of these woods, and you run across some stone wall, evidence that it used to be a farm and abandoned. So over the last hundred years, this succession has taken place from what used to be farmland and has turned into these forests. Secondary succession. And here is that very example, abandoned farmland. So this is what happened in Rhode Island. We came along, piled up all these rocks and made the fence, tried to make a living out of it. Didn't work very well, not just in New England, but it's happened a lot of places. And so secondary succession, that's not primary succession, but secondary succession took place. And then you have these forests, woods, all over the place. Rhode Island, Massachusetts, Connecticut, very common of uh, these climax communities are those deciduous trees. If you move farther north, again to Maine and Vermont and parts of New Hampshire, then it's not these deciduous trees that are at the climax forest. It's coniferous trees. You've got a lot of pine trees up there. So that is the series of events that take place on land, that, that the type of succession that's very common in Rhode Island and probably some of the places that you're from. And so you start out, if you're talking about primary succession, with bare rocks, nothing living there. And then you have these pioneer species that show up. And then the, you progress through these different stages. And over time, you eventually reach some climax community. And the same thing is in is true for secondary succession. It's just that the starting point is different because it's not a completely barren habitat where there's no living things. But in the end, you end up with some kind of a climax community. And along the way, this habitat becomes better and better in terms of the amount of energy and in terms of the conditions being fine for being able to, to make a living there. There's more trees, there's more three-dimensional habitat, so there's more niches to be filled. And overall, the diversity increases. When you finally get to these climax communities, then there's a tendency for some things to be outcompeted because that's what these climax species are. Climax community, very good competitors. They last for a long time. So then the diversity tends to go down a little. And if you have another disturbance, another fire, somebody chops all these trees down, some kind of development or something, uh, then you'll go back to this low level of diversity, but it'll eventually make its way back up. Well, let's look at some of these changes that take place. It's not just the plants that are changing, but of course plants have a big influence on everything else in these communities. There's also animals. The The diversity of animals changes. So you can imagine the kind of animals you could find in grass. If, if, the, if it's grass and, and, and weeds, low-lying things compared to, for instance, a forest. You're going to find a lot of different things in forests. So if you look at these early successional species, things that have do, do well in grasses, mid-successional species where there's a combination of grass and forests, and late successional species, which are pretty dominated by forests and things that do well in and amongst trees. So as the community structure 
changes as succession takes place over time. You have an increase in species diversity. Maybe it drops off at the end when you reach the climax community. You have a, a change in the trophic structure, who's eating who, how energy is flowing from one organism to another. That changes quite a bit. You certainly have a big change in the niches that are available. The niches that are available in a forest where trees are 150 feet tall versus a, a grassland where the tall grasses are 15 inches tall. And then in terms of how energy is flowing through these ecosystems and how nitrogen is flowing through these ecosystems, <clears throat> all those things change. And also nutrients as well. So let's look at that for an example. You could look at all those other things. Take some time to look at those. But look what happens during these successional, successional stages in a forest. This takes 200 years for this, this community transition to take place from the pioneer stage to the climax community. So that picture, that drawing of the, the vegetation up there, that's what's happening in terms of the plants. Of course, animals would be changing at the same time. Animals you have in the grassland versus the, the tall forest. But let's look at the yellow in the bottom and in terms of the nitrogen, the amount of nitrogen. And if you look at the difference between nitrogen in year one and year 100 and year 150, year 200, the amount of nitrogen that's in the soil increases quite a bit. The amount of nitrogen that's falling off of these trees in the form of leaves, that's a dead bear laying on the, the floor of the forest. All these sources of nitrogen increase a lot. There's a lot of leaf litter. There's a lot of dead, decaying organic matter. So the amount of nitrogen. You could also look at phosphorus. You could look at sulfur. You could look at carbon. Same thing. You'd find that changes with time. So we've been focusing on plants. What happens with plants as succession takes place? But the point is, it's not just plants that are changing in this community. It's all these other things as well. <clears throat> well, we looked at this idea of disturbance and equilibrium. You know, uh, how what uh, explains the diversity that you see in communities. Well, in a lot of communities, disturbance is part of the natural history of this community. You've got primary succession to begin with. So you've got some bare habitat. And once a community is established and it goes through succession, reaches a climax community, then there can be some big disturbance. And this community goes back to uh, uh, an initial state and you have the re-entry of these pioneer species. And you have the succession up to a climax community. And then there's a disturbance. And then there's another disturbance. So these disturbances might be after the climax community is established. So all the way to the right of this figure. But there also could be disturbances along the way. So you haven't gotten anywhere near. This could be after five years or after 10 years. It takes 150 years to reach the, the climax community. So there could be disturbances and resetting, re going back to an intermediate community, going back to, a, to a, the pioneer community. There's disturbances that mark a lot of the events that are taking place in succession. It's not necessarily a constant stream of changes that take place. So what kind of changes are taking place as new species show up? Well, we'll look at some, some different ways that you can describe the effects that the species that are showing up there to begin with have on species that come along later. So you've got lichens and you have mosses, and they break up the rocks, and they, they basically turn rocks, this barren rock, into a little bit of soil. And then grasses come along later, and they make a lot more soil. And when you have things with leaves that are dropping down, and you have animals that are they're making 
soil by contributing all this organic matter, you have the habitat is changing quite a bit. So we're going to look at these three different ways that the organisms that come along first influence the community afterwards. We'll look at facilitation, inhibition, and tolerance. Some species have uh, the effect of making a, a habitat or a community easier to live in. So in other words, they facilitate how easy it is for species to come along later. One of the best examples that are easiest to understand is soil. If you need soil and things are dying and they're decaying and they're being mixed with the minerals in the rocks and you have a thicker and thicker soil that's being produced, a more and more rich organic soil, that's a better habitat for the species that come along later. So there's a number of pioneer species that are facilitators. So they, their role is facilitation. Now, some of these, you know, the standard life history, they come in, they take advantage of this, and, and then they're not that good at competitors. So they take advantage of this habitat, and then they move on to some other one. They, they're replaced by something that comes along later. But they don't necessarily want to just give in. So there's some early species that inhibit the ability of species to come in and replace them. Or one of their roles in the community succession might be inhibition. We looked at secondary compounds and toxins that are released by plants. And so there's some competition for this space, this habitat, occupying that niche. And then there's a number of other ones. There's a number of other species that they... It's, as long as they're, they're not crowded out and their niche isn't replaced and they're not competing, there's a high degree of tolerance. So some species might overlap quite a bit with, with a stage of succession that comes along later. So there's tolerance. That might be the type of interaction that early successional species have with later ones. All right, then the, the last thing, look at this briefly, not in a whole lot of detail, but it, we've been focusing almost exclusively on these terrestrial systems a lot with, a, with a forests. For instance, uh, there's farm, farmland that, that's where the, all the trees are chopped down, or there's a pond that's filled up, drained, and uh, turns into a meadow, those kind of things. But let's look at a couple of aquatic systems. We saw, if you're talking about a forest, or you're talking about farmland, it could be 150, 200, 200 years before you reach a climax community. Some of them are faster than that, but it's quite a bit of time. If you're talking about the rocky inner tidal in the ocean, rocks along the shoreline, now, these are disturbed a lot of the time. Sometimes they're formed by erosion or they're formed by a landslide or something like that. And sometimes there's a big storm that comes in and wipes everything out. So there's a lot of disturbance there. But in these rocky intertidal communities, you've got pioneer species like algae. And then you've got some that come along later, like red algae, green algae. Eventually, in a relatively short period of time, you've got a climax community red algae and also you've got these different types of animals there snails starfish urchins that are going along some of them feeding on the algae some of them feeding on other animals and so the succession is similar where you have this transition from one type of species to another and and maybe not as much uh influence on the other organisms other than the fact that there's algae there to be eaten but the point is that this whole process of succession up to the climax community takes place in a relatively short period of time you're talking about five years instead of 150 or 200 so you might have some bare rock and then you have the 
algae that start showing up, and then you have barnacles, you have snails, you have mollusks, you have uh, mussels, those kind of things. And then there's a wave action storms that can set everything back to zero. Another thing to look at is stream communities. So you've got a stream. The type of disturbance could be a big flood or it could be some kind of erosion, landslide, something. There could be some resetting of this community where the climax community is affected very negatively, destroyed, and then things start over again. So you see the same kind of thing. Diatoms is a pioneer species, and there's blue-green algae, which is cyanobacteria, green algae. So you have the establishment of these primary producers, and then you have some diatoms, green algae, blue-green algae. Those are all the primary producers, plant-like. They're not plants, but they're plant-like organisms. And then you have things that come along and feed on them, things that take shelter in them, and animals that feed on the organisms that are associated with these. And so you have the same type of succession, but in this case, 70 days. You're talking about 70 days instead of five years. You're talking about 70 days instead of 150 or 200 years. So the patterns are similar where you have this succession from a bare type of habitat, whether that's a rocks in a stream or whether that's rocks in the rocky inner tidal or whether that's some kind of a rocky barren landscape on land. And on land, from the this whole process of succession might take 300 years. It might take 150 years. On, in an intertidal, it might take five years. In a stream, it might take 70 years, but 70 days. But the processes that are taking place, the inter interactions that are taking place, the roles that these organisms have in succession, and some of the changes that are taking place in these communities, in terms of the diversity and the nutrients and those kind of things. They're similar amongst these different types of communities. So that'll be the end of this first lecture for today.